everybody has a day, when we will have to enter God's courtroom. But the day and time is unspecified. However, we will be dragged into this court by death. So the question is, what happens immediately after death? The Bible reveals very few concrete details about heaven, the afterlife, and what happens when we die. God must have a good reason for keeping us wondering about the mysteries of heaven. Perhaps our minds could never comprehend the realities of eternity. For now, we can only imagine. So, what exactly happens when you die? What do the Bible have to say about those who die without knowing Jesus Christ, and not accepting him as Lord and Savior? Where do the righteous go after death? Are we given second chances after death? Yet, the Bible does reveal many truths about the afterlife. In this fourth episode, the HN Ministries will take a comprehensive look at what the Bible says about death, eternal life, and heaven. So sit back relax, and open your hearts, minds, and spirits to be influenced by the Word of God. BHN Ministries brings to you Life After Death The Bible is primarily a book about life. It tells us how to experience everlasting life, and also how to enjoy an abundant life here on earth. Even John 3.16 talks about life. The writer says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible is not primarily a book about death, yet it treats the subject of death many times because death is part of the cycle of life in God's plan. All of us, waiting for the return of Christ, are going to die. Some will grow old and die. Some will die at an earlier age. We fade like flowers, and wither, like grass, as Psalms 103 states. We all, experience aging, and illness, and frailties of some kind. And although, we can be thankful for the wonders of modern medicine, and for the skills of dedicated doctors, the fact still remains that death will come to all of us. And at death, the body will return to the dust of the earth. And the soul will be carried immediately either into the presence of Christ, or, it will enter into a place called Hades, better known as Hell, for those who die in their sins. Following death, there is an intermediate state, the time between death, and the final judgment. And there is also a final state, the eternal destiny, which will last forever. In this study, we want to look at the intermediate state of what happens during the interval between death and the final judgment. Jesus told about the self-centered ungodly rich man in Luke 16. The ungodly man died, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Luke, chapter 16, verse 23. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Hades, a word which in the New Testament is used to describe the place where the unsaved dead go immediately upon death. The Greek word for hell, as a final destiny, is a different word. The word Gehenna, was used to describe the Valley of Hinnom, the garbage dump on the south side of Jerusalem. It was the place where wild dogs gnashed their teeth as they fought over the garbage of the dump. Gehenna is the final place of punishment, Hades is the intermediate place of the dead, in Luke 16. Jesus says, the souls of the wicked go to Hades after death. But in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28, Jesus speaks about hell also. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. 
but rather fear him, who is able to destroy both soul, and body in hell. There, he says, that both soul, and body, are cast into Gehenna after the resurrection and final judgment. In Matthew 10, Jesus is talking about final judgment, but in Luke 16, he is talking about what happens immediately after death. Hades, is like a county jail. A temporary prison. Until the sentence is determined. The lake of fire, Gehenna. Is like a state penitentiary, a permanent place of punishment. While Hades is not the final destiny of the wicked, it is a place of conscious suffering and of despair place of torment. The man in Luke 16 wanted someone to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. Luke. Chapter 16. Verse 24. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. At another place, the Bible says that the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust under punishment for, or, until, the day of judgment. 2 Peter. Chapter 2. Verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Hades is a temporary prison, where the wicked dead are kept under punishment until the day of judgment and the final sentence is named. The purpose of the judgment is not so much to determine who is saved and who is lost. The matter of salvation has been determined by our decision regarding Jesus Christ here in this life. For example, John. Chapter 6. Verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he, who believes in me, has everlasting life. The word believes is a strong word. It means to embrace, and to cling to, it includes repentance and obedience. Those who sincerely receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of their lives, are assured of eternal life. By way of contrast, those who do not know God, and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord, Jesus Christ shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord as stated in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 8 through 9. In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. And so, the final judgment is not so much designed to determine who is saved and who is lost, as it is to determine the degree of punishment and the degree of reward. Every human being will someday stand before the judgment bar of God. There will be rewards and there will be appropriate punishment. Exactly when and how God will accomplish all this, is not really important for us to know. Revelation. Chapter 20. Verses 13 and 14. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so, when the text says that death and Hades will deliver up the dead who were in them, those in Hades, the temporary prison, will be judged and then cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire will be the eternal destiny of the unsaved. The Bible teaches that those who are saved, having embraced the blood of Jesus on the cross, will at death go to be with Christ, in a state of conscious bliss and are immediately in fellowship with Christ. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver, or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. The Apostle Paul declared that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And later, he says that, to die, is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Jesus speaks of the immediate abode of the saved dead, as paradise. He said to the thief on the cross, in Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The righteous dead are in the presence of Christ, in a place called paradise. Awaiting the resurrection of the body the judgment, the final reward and the future life in heaven. It might be helpful to explain that before the death and resurrection of Jesus, Hades had two regions. One for the righteous and the other for the unrighteous. Not only were the wicked in Hades, but so were the righteous in Old Testament times. In the account of the rich man and Lazarus, in Luke 16, before the death and resurrection of Jesus, there was a great gulf between the two regions. But they were close enough to each other that the self-centered rich man could communicate with the patriarch Abraham. The scriptures indicate that Christ descended into Hades before he went back to the Father, at the time of his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. In the book of Acts, says that his soul was not left in Hades and that his body did not see corruption. And says that Jesus was raised up and exalted at the right hand of the Father. And in the book of Ephesians, says that when Christ ascended on high, he led captivity captive. It is the belief of many evangelical Bible teachers that it was at this time that those in the righteous portion of Hades were led into the place called Paradise in New Testament times. Jesus descended into Hades, set the Old Testament saints free, and took them to Paradise to be with him. And now, when saved persons die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If the scriptures are properly interpreted, and they are, then immediately after death, the saved find themselves in paradise and the lost find themselves in Hades. Exactly what activities will take place during the time between death and judgment is not revealed in scripture. The Bible is restrained in what it says about life immediately following death. There are many questions about life after death that go beyond the limits of our understanding. Now we see through a glass darkly, but a marvelous day is coming when those mysteries will be completely unveiled. We do know two major facts. Unbelievers will be in a state of anguish and torment. And the saved will be resting from their labors in joyful satisfaction. The spirits of those who die in their sins will be ushered immediately in Hades, and after the judgment, both body and soul will be delivered into the lake of fire. The spirits of those who die in Christ will be ushered immediately into the paradise of God, and upon receiving new bodies, eventually will be transported into the final heavenly home, which Jesus says he is preparing for his people. John. Chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there, you may be also. Christ achieved victory over death when he arose from the grave, and his followers have the promise of an afterlife in paradise, and eventually in the heavenly home. However, death is still associated with sadness even for the Christian, because of the tremor of separation. But death is no longer oppressive for us because we have the assurance of entering Christ's presence when we die, and that is far better than life here on earth. Still, death is a time of grief and sadness. There are three observations about dying victoriously. Number 1. While as believers, we prepare for death, death is not the central focus of our lives. The central focus for us is the resurrection. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. This verse expresses the truth that we aim to be found in Christ, and that our goal is to know the power of his resurrection. We look to the day when Jesus will appear and abolish death, and transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. Philippians. Chapter 3. Verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We look at death in light of Christ's great triumph, his return as King of Kings, raising the dead, and bringing life here on earth to a conclusion. While we prepare for death, death is not the central focus of our lives. Our focus is on the resurrection. Number 2. While we are burdened for those we love and leave behind at death, we recognize that our dying will be great gain. When we approach the borders of death, we are mindful of the fact that those we leave behind will be lonely and will grieve at our passing. Letting our friends behind is always painful. Hearing the news about a sudden death, or standing by the bedside of one who is dying, is always distressful. But when we arrive in the paradise of God, the mysteries in our lives will become clear, and God will demonstrate the marvels of his grace that saved us. We are told in the book of Ephesians that in the ages to come, Jesus will show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us. Even the hard times which we face in this life are products of the kindness of God. And number three. While we enjoy life here on earth, it is enjoyed only temporarily, because we are ready to depart from it. People of the world are not ready to depart from this life. They try and crack funny jokes, and kid around with each other. If they do talk about the afterlife, it is mostly about Saint Peter with a bunch of keys. Sometimes it seems that such conduct is engaged in to hide some of the deep feelings of fear and uncertainty that worldly people are living with. Those who are genuinely committed to serving Christ can truly enjoy life because death is not a constant dread. We think about it. It is an enemy. It brings sadness. We are not anxious for it. But deep down within we know that, to die is gain. For the Christian, it means to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. Our reparation for death begins with faith in Jesus Christ, repentance for sin and receiving Christian baptism. It continues with believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and the work he did for us on the cross. It will issue into a life that moment by moment seeks to walk in obedience to God's word, and to live in fellowship with his church, and to move day by day under the direction of the Holy Spirit. For the genuine disciple of Christ, death is faced with a sense of anticipation, we look at death like a prisoner, awaiting release from prison, like a school child, when the end of the term is near, like a migrant bird, ready to fly south, and like a person in the hospital, ready to go home. Medical science can help people die relatively painlessly, but only the Christian message of hope through Christ can help us die in victory. Let us make it a point to avoid foolish ways of living, and seek to live wisely, skillfully and according to God's pattern. This concludes our fourth episode. None of us knows how soon our lives will be snuffed out. The uncertainty of life and the certainty of death should cause us to make commitments to follow the Lord more carefully, and to bring the unsaved into a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ.